there are few games that have the legacy of the Master Chief Collection. A game that had the life of a franchise riding on it. A game that promised from the second of its announcement to over-deliver and to fulfil the dreams of millions. A game that was deemed so iconic, many thought it would never even come into existence. Today, I, a grizzled veteran of the MCC, am going to guide you through the rather tumultuous history of this game, as someone who lived through it all and has the scars to show it. But to take you on such a journey requires funding, powers from beyond, and so I'm excited to announce today's very fitting sponsor, Acer and Xbox Game Pass. With the incredible wealth of titles available on Xbox Game Pass for PC, you need a monster of a machine and accessories to push them into the stratosphere. And that's where Acer come in. For gaming on the go, look no further than the Acer Predator Triton 500. A slim, sleek and gorgeous looking gaming laptop, complete with the raw power of an RTX 2080 Super, an i7 mobile processor, and up to 32GB of high clock speed DDR4 RAM, and an insane 1080p 300Hz screen. Looking to maybe bolster your home setup? The Predator XB3 monitor has you covered, coming in 24, 27 or 32 inches, 4K with as low as a 0.5 millisecond response time for lightning fast reactions in first person shooter games like, you guessed it, Halo. When it comes to mice, the Predator Cestus 510 has you covered, with its optional weights and swappable top cover for peak comfort and utility. And as for great audio, the Galea 350 headset does the trick and then some, with great audio and easily adjustable volume and mic mute buttons. It really doesn't get much better than this, for comfort, performance or just pure aesthetics. There is no better way to experience the insane Game Pass library than this, and on the topic of Game Pass, you can get up to 12 months of Game Pass PC as well as a 3 year warranty on certain Predator products. And to top all of this off, we're running a giveaway as well. A £3,000 Predator gaming setup with a Predator laptop, two XB3 monitors and a backpack full of accessories for the winner, and 100 3 month Game Pass PC codes for the runner ups as well. To enter, just click the Gleam link in the description, and also keep an eye out throughout the rest of the video. Only themselves have given me a secret code to hide somewhere within that gives you an extra chance at winning this giveaway. So, thank you to Acer and Game Pass for sponsoring the video, and let us begin the redemption story of Halo, the Master Chief Collection. The story of the Master Chief Collection begins before its announcement. The early 2010s were a rough time for the Halo franchise. Halo Reach shook the boat a bit with the way that it changed Halo's gameplay, but it still managed to keep the boat afloat, and really, and then some. But then Halo 4 came along. So Halo 4's multiplayer really doubled down on the contentious changes that Bungie made with Reach, exacerbating existing problems and creating entirely new ones, and as such, Halo 4 was the first Halo game in the franchise history to essentially die. The population of Halo 4 fell off a cliff edge mere months after launch. General interest in Halo dipped hard, and for the first time ever, Halo had truly been usurped by its competitor. Call of Duty. Black Ops 2 launched alongside Halo 4. It really overpromised and overdelivered on every front and frankly smoked Halo 4's attempt to entice new fans in with its more generic COD styled multiplayer. It's difficult to accurately describe the general sentiment towards Halo during this era, but as somebody who experienced the golden years of the franchise and then went on to experience this age, to say that it was depressing would really be the understatement of the century. Not three years prior, Halo was on top of the world, the king of console first person shooters, and now it was like nobody even knew it existed. Those few who stuck around were filled with despair, hollowed from the experience, but little did we know, hope was right around the corner.
The general consensus with Halo 4 was that it failed because it strayed too far off the blessed path. It tried to turn Halo into something that it wasn't, and many believe that a return to form was the only way forward for Halo. Now, in 2011, 343 released Halo Combat Evolved Anniversary, and although it wasn't the best, it showed that there was clearly interest in remastered versions of the classic games, and considering that Halo 2's 10th anniversary was right around the corner, fans were filled with hope. It was the perfect storm. Halo needed a return to form. The 10th anniversary of the game that many fans considered to be the peak of the franchise was less than a year away, and so the rumours began to circulate. In the months leading up to E3 2014, rumour after rumour would begin circulating about the elusive Halo 2 anniversary. Many of these rumours were likely started by desperate fans who were clinging on to what little hope still remained that their beloved franchise could once again regain its crown. But others came from up high. Phil Spencer and even Steve Downs himself hinted at H2A a few times. However, in time, all of these rumours would be squashed by either 343 or Microsoft. But still, fans remained hopeful. The lead up to E3 2014 is a time that I will never forget, and the payoff was even better than any of us had ever hoped. The stage went dark. The Halo Choir came bellowing over the speakers, and we were greeted with the best announcement trailer in the history of the franchise, a modern recreation of the iconic Halo 2 announcement trailer from 2004 that simultaneously connected to the enigmatic Halo 5, confirmed the return of the fan-favourite character, the Arbiter, added even more mystery to the already mysterious character of Agent Locke, and even teased the elite homeworld of Sanghelios in Halo 5. I still get immense shivers watching this trailer, honestly. It was everything that I'd hoped for multiplied by 7, but Halo 2 Anniversary wasn't all we were getting. They then went on to confirm that H2A was launching as a part of the Master Chief Collection, which contained Halo CE, Halo 2, Halo 3, and Halo 4 as well, all coming with their classic multiplayers intact, exactly as we remembered them 10 years ago, but now running on dedicated servers at 1080p, 60 frames per second. 343 didn't just give the Halo community what they wanted, they went above and beyond. Immediately, Halo was back on the map, the entire gaming industry were hyping up the Master Chief Collection, and it truly felt like Halo had regained its crown. Following E3 2014, two words were ingrained into the brains of every single Halo fan. We back. After months of reveals, of hype, of teasers and build-up, on the 11th of November, 10 years and 2 days after the launch of Halo 2, Halo, the Master Chief Collection launched. Thousands of people booked sick days off work, skipped college classes or, like me, stayed up all night with school the next morning to just relive the memories of old and witness the return of Halo. The hype that 343 had built up was nothing short of biblical, and as such, expectations were higher than Mount Kilimanjaro. But we were in for quite the shock. The launch of the MCC can best be described as whiplash. What most expected to be the saving grace of the franchise turned out to be yet another nail in its coffin. To put it simply, the game just did not work. Matchmaking was slow, buggy, or just flat out broken. Games started with unbalanced teams, with maps loading in incorrectly or not loading in at all. Campaign missions didn't work or were entirely broken. Co-op didn't work or was incredibly laggy. The menus were broken. Games were crashing, freezing, corrupting, and more. Pretty much everything that could have gone wrong, went wrong. What released was a broken game, a stain on the legacy of these iconic games that the MCC was supposed to be honouring. Halo's first step into the illustrious next gen went down in history as one of the worst video game launchers ever. Pretty much overnight, all of the excitement for Halo that had re-emerged across the wider gaming community after it was lost by Halo 4 turned to 
anger, bitterness, and mockery. Something you've got to understand about the MCC is that, really, it was a technical marvel, even in its broken state. I mean, they managed to fit six games and seven engines onto one disc with the ability to switch between games and engines, theoretically, at a moment's notice. What 343, Saber Interactive, and everyone else involved had achieved was nothing short of unbelievable, but sadly, it was just that. It was unbelievable. They'd bitten off more than they could chew, and sadly, things would only get worse. What followed the launch of the MCC in 2014 was a year of relatively lackluster fixes. Those who were still working on the MCC at 343 tried their best to fix the game, but ultimately, nothing much changed. With a game of this scale, fixing bugs was essentially a game of whack-a-mole. You fix a bug in Halo 4? Great, two new bugs have now popped up in Halo CE and Halo 3. You fix those bugs? Well, now Halo 2's found a new way to break. I do not envy the job those developers had that year. Their task was essentially impossible, but you know what? Credit where it's due, they damn well tried to fix it. A series of updates came out over the year, and the experience got ever so slightly better, but it was still far from what the community were promised. They did go out of their way to add ODST to the collection, updated to 1080p and 60fps as kind of a gesture of apology for how the game launched, and also a gesture of thanks to those who had continued to stick with the game during its rough state, and it was a nice addition, although I will say, in hindsight, it does kind of confuse me that they spent the time to port over ODST, instead of actually fixing what was there, but that probably just speaks more to how insanely difficult it was to fix such a monster of a game, more so than anything. Ultimately, every patch that year really just felt like a band-aid over an energy sword wound, and those players, like myself, who stuck with the MCC through this time knew that these bug fixes would soon come to an end. With the release of Halo 5 rapidly approaching, it was very clear that 343 wanted all hands on deck for the next major entry into the franchise, and thus, the future of the MCC was looking uncertain. Time was running out, and the game wasn't even close to the quality bar that a Halo game should aim to meet. And when Halo 5 launched, the inevitable happened. What I call the Era of Silence began. No bug fixes, no promises of future support, not even an offhand mention. It was like this game that was supposed to be 343's love letter to the legacy of the legendary franchise they inherited, to the fans new and old, and that was meant to act as the catalyst to get Halo back on top just didn't exist anymore. The level of radio silence was, frankly, weird. It was clear they wanted everyone to focus on the big, new, shiny Halo 5 and forget about what had happened with MCC, but people weren't going to let them brush it under the rug. The comment section of every single post, video, and article for the next two years was guaranteed to be filled with people replying, hashtag fix MCC. People were not going to let this go, and for good reason. But sadly, I didn't call this the era of silence for nothing. For two whole years, the Master Chief Collection was totally and utterly ignored. Fans were beginning to lose all hope that this game would ever even be acknowledged again, let alone fixed or even enhanced like many had hoped. It seemed as though all hope was lost and the Master Chief Collection had been forgotten. However, in the October of 2017, events were set in motion that would change the course of human history. Events that the brightest minds humanity had to offer were sure would never come to pass. Events foretold in ancient scriptures to only exist in the dreams of those overtaken by the powers of Hopium. The inconceivable actually happened on stream. 343 announced their plans to finally fix the Master Chief Collection. This was the beginning of a redemption story like no other. By launching the Halo Insider program, 343 would be allowing the community themselves to beta test updated builds. 
these became known as flights, which were emblematic of their new approach to the game. The Master Chief Collection was to become a community-driven collection. Over the next year, Fu 4 Fu released various flights, each one delivering noticeable improvements to the experience in the form of bug fixes, stability improvements, UI overhauls, and even minor feature additions, and also major feature additions. The Social Match Composer, allowing you to search for any game type on any game with any size team was added, from big team battle to 1v1s. Easily one of the best matchmaking additions I've ever seen come to a game. They even went as far as doing timed themed events for the game, like infecting the MCC with the Flood or having Yap Yap the Destroyer seize control of the game. Really cool little details that breathed a lot of life into the game and showed their commitment to it. It was so clear that 343 were committed to doing this game right and clearing the black cloud that was hovering over the studio while it remained unfixed. Bonnie Ross also announced on the stream that they were now committed to having a better dialogue with fans and to being more open with them in the future, which, after two years of pure silence, was like the finest music to our ears. And although this was just the beginning of the Master Chief Collection's redemption story, I first have to highlight an unsung hero of this story. Sketch. Without Sketch, I fear this story would have gone an entirely different way. See, Sketch was a Bungie OG. If you dip into the archives, you'll see him everywhere in old Bungie Vidocs, and in 2016, he joined 343 and reunited with the Halo franchise as a part of the community team. So, because his role was very community focused, naturally he started getting bombarded with messages about the MCC, and so, unknowing of the game's past, he started asking around the studio to try and find out information about what exactly was happening with it and if there was anything to share, because clearly there was a large number of fans out there that were frustrated with the game's state at the time. Now, bear in mind, this was during the era of silence. At a time when it seemed like a gag order had been issued on the MCC, Sketch managed to get 343 talking about it once again, and the result was something beautiful. But in the words of the famous green cyborg Halo Man, I think we're just getting started. 2018 was just a teaser for what 343 had in store with the MCC. If only we knew what 2019 had in store. Well, actually, technically, <laughs> I and a few others kind of did, and it was the hardest secret that I ever had to keep, but that's neither here or there. To understand the next era of MCC, which I will be dubbing the Era of Dreams, you first need some context. Halo has always had a very strange relationship with PC, holding all the way back to the franchise's inception. In the 90s, Halo started out as a Mac RTS game, Following Halo's buyout by Microsoft for the Xbox, Bungie still worked with Gearbox to port Halo CE to the PC, which released in 2003 and came with modding tools so good that new mods are still being created today. Halo 2 also got a PC port in 2007, although it was tied to the god-awful Games for Windows Live service, lacked any proper modding tools, and was not received well, but sadly that was really where Halo's relationship with PC ended. For years, well over a decade in fact, fans begged for Halo 3 PC, some even going as far as trying to create it themselves with El Dorito, a modded version of Halo Online that blew up and showed the clear demand for Halo on PC, arguably a catalyst for the next era of MCC. When the MCC was originally announced, there was hope that at some point Xbox would reevaluate their stance on PC gaming and give the fans that had stuck with the franchise over the years, despite not even being able to play it on their platform, what they wanted. Of course, as per anything with MCC, rumours came and went over the years about the mythical Master Chief Collection PC port, but it wasn't until 2019 that our dreams would, once again, be realised. After a series of mysterious, pizza-based teasers, Sketch, one of the heroes of today's story, confirmed, finally, that the Master Chief Collection was coming to Steam, not just as a mere port, but rather a premier PC experience. And with it, yet another pipe dream was being fulfilled. Halo Reach would officially be coming with it. 
Now, I try and describe the reactions to this news myself, but I don't think I could do them justice. I think it's best that we just let them play. Ah! No way! Yes! <laughs> yes! What followed this cataclysm was a summer and autumn of flights for Halo Reach, once again allowing the community to play a part in this monumental occasion. Because of the Herculean task that lay ahead for the relatively small team working on MCC, the games in the collection would release one by one in chronological order over the following year or so, starting with Reach, as opposed to all of them releasing on day one. As development progressed, fans began to get increasingly impatient for the game to finally launch, and so a phrase was coined to describe 343's attitude and philosophies towards development. A phrase that really was music to the ears of all the MCC veterans like myself, who suffered through the eras of pain, suffering, and silence. Ready when it's ready. This, more than anything, showed 343's commitment to getting MCC right this time, and to not repeat the sins of the father. On December 3rd, 2019, the Master Chief Collection's PC journey began, with Reach launching simultaneously on both Xbox and Steam, and as such, so too began the era of turbulence. The launch itself went down really, really well. Population figures were through the roof, every man and his dog were playing, streaming, and talking about Halo again. It really, truly, for the first time ever, felt like Halo was back. But this euphoria didn't last forever. Now, when you look at the popularity of the MCC, you have to look at it through a different lens. These are old games, upwards of almost two decades old, and as such, don't really correlate with what the modern gaming market expects from a game. The main drive for MCC is, more so than anything, nostalgia. That ever-burning wish to return to your golden years and to re-experience those memories that you hold so dear. So, with that in mind, the population of Reach dropped over the following month or two, which honestly should have been expected given the circumstances. It never got so low that it was unplayable or anything, but it definitely didn't retain the six figures like some had hoped. However, there was a reason for this beyond the fading of nostalgia. Reach PC launch lacking a number of PC-centric features, such as uncapped frame rate and in-depth graphic settings. It launched without Forge or Theatre, but notably, it launched with a large number of bugs that really withered away the overall experience. Reach's iconic armory customization system was also gutted in favour of a really generic battle pass as well, which certainly didn't help. But as great as it was to be playing MCC on PC, the rather disappointing launches didn't end with Reach. The launch of Combat Evolved introduced a number of bugs, some pretty obnoxious such as completely broken audio and music, which strangely ended up getting backported to the console version of MCC Combat Evolved. These issues were never present on console prior to the launch of CE on PC. Higher frame rates caused weapon spread to increase massively, making certain weapons like the Magnum far less effective. And on Xbox, somehow, Halo 3 became nigh on unplayable thanks to crippling frame drops. This launch was rather unacceptable, but the worst was yet to come. Halo 2's launch was a 2014 tier disaster. Credit where it's due, many of the bugs introduced with the CE launch were fixed with this update, but with those fixes came a plethora of new problems. Halo 3's Warthogs just started driving themselves in multiplayer. Halo 2's hit registration was beyond broken, making the game utterly unplayable at times. But worst of all was the shoot the floor bug. Now, this was never present in any of the flights, which was kind of weird, but given that it allowed you to shoot, rocket, 
melee, or even grenade the floor and kill a random enemy or teammate wherever they were on the map, it didn't make for the best launch. To say that Halo 2 multiplayer was unplayable on PC at launch would be quite the understatement. Thankfully, 343 did patch this bug pretty quick, but it just added to the ever-growing list of major bugs that these games were shipping with, and really made people ponder whether ready when it's ready was a philosophy that had been all but abandoned. However, things were about to change, and for the better. Halo 3's launch went down pretty damn well. After 13 years, PC players could finally finish the fight and do so with a relatively bug-free version of Halo 3 that even went as far as fixing the downgraded audio that had been present in MCC's Halo 3 since 2014, as well as giving us piece-by-piece -piece armor customization that was in parity with classic Halo 3. Reach's Forge was finally added, and along with Halo 3's Forge, was actually expanded as well, adding in a wealth of new items, vehicles, environment pieces, and more from campaign levels and multiplayer maps that were never available in Classic Forge. But the additions didn't stop there. With Halo 3 came our first set of modern cosmetics for these old games, something that would become a staple of all future updates. Halo Combat Evolved received visor colours, along with a ton of really great weapon and vehicle skins that I personally love. They add a unique visual flair to these assets that we've seen and used a billion times over already, and in my opinion, really do fit with the aesthetic and theming of Combat Evolved. I could honestly see Bungie adding these to Combat Evolved back in the day if times were different. I, I really like these skins. But if you think that adding skins to a game this pure is akin to desecrating it with filthy footsteps, then 343 had you covered. With these skins came a universal toggle, allowing you to toggle on and off these modern additions to retain the original experience. Halo 3 was above all else the launch that 343 needed to get right. It wasn't perfect, and as expected, it introduced its fair share of bugs that have been mostly patched over time, but after Reach, Combat Evolved, and Halo 2, fans were worried, but with Halo 3 PC, 343 absolutely delivered when it mattered the most. And following Halo 3, it would only get better. ODST's launch was yet another massive dub. Again, it did come with a few bugs, which is kind of expected, but overall, the quality was exactly what it needed to be, and again, 343 went above and beyond, finally porting ODST Firefight over to the MCC, which was something people had been requesting for five years at that point, along with also expanding ODST's Firefight customization, giving the player even more choices than before in how they deck out their troopers, and even further, going as far as backporting the ODST SOCOM, suppressed SMG, and brute plasma rifle to Halo 3 multiplayer. This update really felt like a turning point for the Master Chief Collection, as it was here where it really began to take on a life of its own and become more than just a mere collection of old games. The experience these games provided on MCC was unlike anything their classic iterations could offer, for reasons that now surpassed simple graphical upgrades. And then, in November 2020, the final piece of the Master Chief Collection puzzle arrived. Halo 4. Halo 4's port was, yet again, pretty damn good. It wasn't perfect, but it was pretty damn good. It did a good job at translating the Halo 4 experience to a brand new platform, but the biggest thing that came with this update were the additions to the overall MCC experience. In addition to Halo 4's Forge receiving an expansion akin to Halo 3 and Halo Reaches, it also brought with it crossplay for the entire Master Chief Collection, in-depth graphic settings, and stellar uncapped frame rate support. This was a fantastic cherry on top of the MCC PC cake, and although the collection was still far from perfect, PC players could now play almost the entire Halo library for the first time ever. But not to sound like a broken record or anything, but as a famous green cyborg once said, I think we're just getting started. Although the MCC was now complete, 
343 were far from done with it. Now, it was time to expand the game beyond its default state. In the months following its completion, the Master Chief Collection team announced plans for a further 10 seasons of content updates, leading up to December 2021, after the release of Halo Infinite, where the game would be re-evaluated to decide whether future content would be approved or not. These new updates aim to almost turn the MCC into MCC Custom Edition. They started out with the addition of armor sets to Halo 3 that were once locked to Halo Online. A rather aesthetic breaking update, but new content nonetheless, and later a toggle was added for these armors so if you wanted you could restore the original Halo 3 aesthetic. Then came the addition of GRD and Mariner to Halo Reach, the former being a mythical helmet that fans had wanted ever since it was cut from the original Reach DLC in 2011. The arrival of this helmet in particular was nothing short of groundbreaking. But yet, the most recent MCC update somehow took it even further. Entirely new ODST armor was added to Halo 3 from Fireteam Raven, the Halo arcade game, along with more Halo Online armor, and even two entirely new maps being added to Halo 3 from Halo Online. Hopefully, the first of many. In the future, a custom game browser is on its way to the MCC, along with proper mod support, and likely even more new armor, maps, and experiences as well. The future of the MCC is incredibly bright, and the team at 343 who have stuck with it and who continue to breathe new life into these iconic titles are doing a damn good job. The collection does still have an abundance of bugs that I do hope get patched in the future and help to bring the games as close to parity as possible with their original versions, but to see how this game has evolved from its 2014 counterpart is nothing short of beautiful. What was once a hollowed, broken husk of a game is now an incredible celebration of the legacy of Halo, and one that I think, for the third time in a row now, just getting started. And that, my friends, is the redemption of the Master Chief Collection. Quite the story, and one that I'm excited to continue experiencing. Huge shout out to everyone on the MCC team who continues to support this game. Honestly, the level of support that it has now would have blown our minds just to think about during the era of silence, so honestly, big props. Don't forget to enter the Acer Predator and Game Pass giveaway, the link is in the description, and thank you all so much for watching. I really do hope you guys enjoyed this beast of a video. Uh, I think you can probably tell that a lot of work went into it, so, you know, if you enjoyed any support you want to show down below, I'd, I'd really appreciate. And so, I want to give a massive thank you to all of my amazing patrons for the support over there. As per usual, you guys are the best, and thank you all so much for watching. I really do appreciate it. And I'll catch you in the next one.